Hey folks, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, today is Tuesday, November 12th. It is 7 p.m. and we are in the council chambers at for the city of Platteville and City Hall. And I will call the meeting to order and we'll start with roll call. Barbara Doss? Yes. Ken Killian? Ken Killian? Here. Robin Klein? Here. Isaac Shanley? Here. Eileen Nichols? Here. Barbara Stockhausen? Here. Jason Arts? Yes. And I would be remiss <clears throat> if I didn't welcome everybody in the audience tonight. I would have to say we have never had a full council chamber where we actually had to wheel in more chairs. So I assume that some of you are here for class. Is that what the majority of you are here for? Okay. And the class, a communication class? Infrastructure. This is all about infrastructure. <coughs> well, that's good because we're going to do a water and sewer bond issue tonight, so that has something to do with infrastructure. And uh, much later in the meeting, we'll be talking about uh, multimodal grant op applications for the special money that was allocated in this year's state budget for uh, road and other infrastructure projects. But that will be much later in the meeting. So anyway, welcome to all of you. And uh, if, you, if you want to speak during the meeting, our procedure is there's a little green uh, sheet on the back and you uh, fill out your name and then you put what you want to talk about and then we call on you and you'll see how that happens quite quickly because I have three or four of them here. Uh, if you needed a copy of the agenda, I don't know what you need to prove you were here, but if you needed a copy of the agenda and uh, you would need to talk to Candace, our, our city clerk, who, who's right over here, and she could perhaps help you with some kind of piece of paper if you need that. If you want to follow along on the agenda, it is on our website, which is at platteville.org. So now we'll move on into the business of the meeting, and that is uh, our first item is consideration of the consent calendar. The following items may be approved on a single motion and vote due to their routine nature of previous discussion. Please indicate, uh, ask any counselor to indicate to me if you want to separate uh, an item for discussion and action. And so the items on the consent calendar tonight are council minutes from October 15th special meeting and October 22nd's regular meeting, our payment of bills, the financial reports for October, appointments to boards and commissions, and tonight I have four. I'm appointing Doug Stevens and Chuck Rundy to the airport commission. I'm appointing Chris Wilson to the water and sewer commission and Frank King to the Police and Fire Commission. Uh, licenses, uh, there are license applications for a temporary Class B, Class B to serve fermented malt beverages and wine to Roundtree Gallery for the Bill Mitchell Art Opening on Friday, December 6th from 5 to 9. We have some one and two year operator license uh, per, uh, applications and we also have a taxi driver license application. And the final consent item is to cancel the meeting of the council currently scheduled for December 24th. Do I hear a motion? I move to approve the consent calendar. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar. We'll vote. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Klein? Yes. Shanley? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Arts? Yes. Motion carries. <clears throat> Okay, we have uh, then uh, one person who has asked to speak during citizens' comments, observations, and petitions, if any, and that would be uh, Ben giving the UW Platteville report. And so uh, he tells me the Senate meeting was equally a populated. Uh, I don't with know about folks. this much, but okay. it was there. So uh, this is your student Senate president, Ben, in case you haven't met him. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, as Barb mentioned, oh, Ben Belke, um, 800 South Chestnut Street. Um, so I am student body president. Um, ever since I've won, I've been coming to these pretty fre frequently to be giving an update about things that happen on our campus um, to the Common Council, as well as any, anybody who ends up watching on, on uh, YouTube later, um, just about things that we have going on on campus, um, just so the general community gets a better idea of what's happening. Um, so just to start it out, um, Greek Life and Greek Life November 15th, which is coming up. 
um, from noon to 5 p.m. Uh, there will be volunteer work. There, um, the majority of the chapters, if not all of them, will be helping in the mining museum for volunteer hours. Um, also, some general dates that are coming up. World of Leadership Conference, November um, 21st. Con um, the keynote speaker is Matt Castellet. He was an old student body president. Now he works for Google. That should be a really good event. Anybody in here can definitely sign up for that. Um, November 19th, also is Women in Government. Both Barb and, and Aline. I, uh, Aline. Yeah, sorry. Aline. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Both of them will be at Women in Government. That's from 2 to 4 in the Marquee. Um, that's on November 19th. Again, anybody is welcome to come to that. Um, that should be a pretty big event. Um, we're also going to be doing voter registration that day as well. Um, so if you, need to get, if you need to get registered or you want more information about that, that would be a good time to go. Um, there's spring bulbs. So um, if anybody was over in Roundtree, um, this weekend, a uh, thousand bulbs were planted at the Roundtree Roundabout. Um, in the spring, those will bloom into orange and blue. Um, so that'll be a really cool thing to see. For renewable energy, campus is exploring some ideas around renewable energy, um, including you know, a solar panel on the, on the west uh, side of campus, um, as well as um, a solar, um, solar farm out on the actual farm, as well as um, two uh, wind turbines. Um, but those are very preliminary. They're still in discussion, but um, that's some things that we're looking for. Also this weekend, myself um, and Kirsten Fry, my, my vice president, we were at UW System Reps. Um, basically what that is is all the student body presidents from all the colleges of the 26 um, college campuses meet together, and we talk about things that are happening in the system. Um, one thing that came up was, um, if anybody is aware, President Cross, the system president, is retiring after this year. So the search and screen committee um, got released, so we talked about that, um, as well as we will be reaching out to a lot of students, asking them what they want to see in a system president, um, and as well as there is an MOU or mer a memorandum of understanding between the, the system and uh, student reps that is finally going to get um, put forth, which is really good. Um, and upon request, I have a couple um, sporting events that are happening. So um, in football this Saturday, um, they're at River Falls, um, so they'll be playing at River Falls. Cross country, the NCAA Midwest Regionals, um, that both men's and women's, that'll be happening at Lake Breeze Golf Course. For men's basketball, um, there's, there's a game tonight for women's, um, but then for men's, um, Friday, November 15th at 8, 8 p.m., and um, then Saturday, November 16th at 7 p.m. For women's, uh, same Friday, November 15th at 6 p.m., and Saturday, November 16th at 2 p.m. And that is all I have. Are there any questions? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I have no other citizen comments, observations, and petitions, so we'll move along then to reports. Uh, there were reports in the packet uh, from the license committee. That would be uh, me, Eileen, and Isaac. Anything to add? Nothing. Nothing? Okay. Police and Fire Commission. Robin? Nothing to add. Uh, Housing Authority Board. No addition. Sorry. Other reports, water and sewer financial reports were in the packet. The airport financial report was in the packet. And our uh, monthly department progress reports were in the packet. Any questions on any? OK, then we'll move along to our first action item. Uh, which is Resolution 1918, authorizing the issuance and sale of $1.66 million in water and sewer system revenue bonds, Series 2019B. <coughs> and Brian. So, yeah, go for it. Fine. So, so just as a way of introduction, um, the city had uh, approved to fund uh, capital projects for the water and sewer utility in the amount of $1,629,839 through the issuance of revenue bonds. Um, the bid opening was today, and Brian Romer, Raymer? Raymer. Raymer from Ailes is here <coughs> to uh, present on the bids that were received and which was the winning bid. Perfect. Thank you, Nicola. Um, you all should have the Ellers packet with our logo as well as Platteville's logo uh, on the cover. 
says the sale day report. Um, so if you move to the first page, as Nicola indicated, uh, Dawn was here about a month ago, which, which you all set the sale for um, the issuance of these bonds. And we had some pre-sale estimates. So anywhere that I kind of reference pre-sale estimates, it's from that pre-sale report that was uh, given about a month ago. Um, today we sold the bonds um, and we had five bidders. So I'll kind of walk through what the results of the sale was and uh, the good news for the city. So that said, this first page um, at the top, sale day report, November 12, 2019. Um, so this was to finance certain water and sewer system uh, improvements that happened in 2019, both uh, past and ongoing. Um, we, we got a rating for these bonds. Your 2015 revenue bonds had a rating as well. So we, we thought with the good results that we had then, we should go back for a rating as, um, you know, if you get a rating such as you did in 2015, you're afforded lower interest rates, especially when it comes to uh, revenue bonds in this case. So that said, you did, um, you know, stand pat, if you will, and that you got a double A minus and uh, the, the interest rates kind of follow uh, suit with that. If you're interested, I did include uh, SMP's comments and report at the end. So that's the final pages. I'm not gonna walk through it because it's a little lengthier and I'm sure these kids wanna get back to studying. Um, so we got five bids. Uh, the winning bid was Northland Securities out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, you can see underneath where we say lower bidder, it's compar comparison from lowest to highest. The reason we show this is kind of um, a little bit of derivation on why we do competitive sales in that you want banks kind of uh, bidding against each other so that you can get lower interest rates. So they all put their bids in and then today they're all released. We award the sale or recommend that you award the sale to the lowest bidder based on true interest costs. So that's, that's cost to you um, in interest over time. So that said, the low tick was 2.46. High tick was 2.59. What that results in is just over $24,000 in interest savings over the life of the loan. Uh, you can see the summary of the sale results there. Um, all in all, I'll say you'll probably notice the agenda item and previous uh, resolutions, the set sale resolution said 1.6 uh, or 7 and then 1.66. Uh, the reason for that is we we're uh, given some premium. Uh, in the sale, and that is where the bidder says, okay, the interest rate market is so low right now, I need to figure out a way I can resell these on the secondary market, uh, which is commonplace um, in a transaction su such as this. So they're gonna sell those at a higher interest rate. So they actually give the city a premium. They pay you for that extra interest cost, and then they also give you a pre what's called a premium. So that premium afforded us to decrease the issue size. In addition to that, um, we actually found out that from our estimates, there were, there were more uh, funds in the uh, bond reserve fund, and which is a good thing. You, you don't want anything lower than that, certainly. But when you have more, then you can use that money uh, then because you actually don't need as much. Uh, so you'll see that in the results. I think it makes more sense when you look at the numbers. So for those two reasons, mainly, um, you were able to downsize. So that's why you see the 1.625 number, which is lower than the previous numbers that you've seen. Um, that said, you can expect the money on December 4th. That's your closing date. Uh, the money will be wired then, and we'll have uh, various emails with staff going on uh, between our bond sale department and, and Northland Securities. Uh, tonight, the only action is to adopt the resolution that awards the sale to Northland, and then also I'll need to walk out with that bid form signed after the passing of the resolution. Uh, so on the next page, uh, this is just a bid tab to show you who all the five bidders were. And this is kind of important to just see where, where the interest was, um, you know, from, from bankers and, and lenders, uh, but that said, you know, mainly you can just see who, who the five bids were and what their uh, net interest costs were. I'm not gonna spend time going over each one of them. On the next page, or two pages, uh, table one is uh, shows kind of those differences in the pre-sale to sale results. And you'll see there, if you look under the debt service reserve rows, we had our preliminary in the, in the yellow column at about 
uh, 1.03 million, and it turns out you had about 1.08. So that's where you get that additional money uh, to be used because all you'll need now in that debt service reserve is 1.09 or 0.19, excuse me. Um, so that said, it, it's you'll see that that difference of 65,000. In addition, um, we had some lower, slightly lower issuance costs when it came to bond council. Um, however, higher costs when it came to S and P. Those are all estimates based on you know recent transactions that we have, but those vary by size and specific transaction to the actual municipality issuing. So, like I said, those are estimates. Um, so those can fluctuate. Um, finally, on on the issuance expenses. They do, these are, they were issued as term bonds. So what that means is you'll make your payments as you usually do. However, they have specific call dates. And as Dawn laid out in the pre-sale meeting, we recommend that you use uh, bond trust services because uh, if you don't, and if that institutional knowledge doesn't pass down, you have to issue certain call notices on certain dates that are uh, way out in the future, like in 2030 and 2035. Uh, so we recommend that you use uh, bond trust services. Um, the fee there is listed the, the 613 um, because it's the fact that you have these term bonds. Um, so that's why we have that in there. Um, certainly, if, if you want to take that out, I highly recommend against it, but we can have that conversation um, and that 613 can be removed. But we have until December, probably about December 1st to decide that. Um, finally, you'll see the 1.625 number at the bottom, and then I've kind of split it out for sewer and water just so you can see what each of those utilities are responsible for. That said, the next two pages are, is the payment structure um, based on the utilities, so you can see what water will be responsible for over time, and then sewer on, on table three on the next page. In addition to, um, we show the preliminary estimates versus the interest rates you got today. So we thought all in all, the interest rates that you received and the premium that you received um, was very good news. Um, we think it's a great time to go out to market given the interest rates. Um, you can look at some of the savings that you'll see on the water side and then on the sewer side. Um, the sewer side, I'll just add, you'll probably see that the actual principal amount is higher and maybe wondering why that happened. That's actually just because the allocation that we do is just kind of a simple proportion based on the debt service reserve. Well, when that total changes, then we have to change that proportion. So um, really it, it is lower all in all. So uh, no, no real difference there. I think you'll see that the difference in total payments about uh, 2,500 bucks. So that said, the only reason the principal increase is because the debt service reserve when that the total amount uh, decreases, you kind of have a higher amount that the sewer then is responsible for based on their apportionment of the costs of the projects. On the final table, on table four, um, we show debt service coverage. Now, as Nicola will know, and if you, as you may remember from the 2015 revenue bonds, when you issue revenue bonds, you're holding to a coverage test and that's ensuring that lenders know that you have revenues that are in place that you can repay the debt. And what that test is, is they want you to have 1.25 times coverage. What that coverage means is you take your revenues, if you just kind of follow the columns, revenues, less expenses, that's the amount of money you have available for debt service. And then you find out, okay, how much debt do we have annually? Is that payment, um, that amount available for debt service, 125% or 1.25? times your debt payment. So in um, the rating call that we had with uh, S&P, it's important to note that they really focus on uh, a coverage ratio that's greater than two in order to reaffirm this rating. So one, you're in a good place um, to pay for these projects because you can see you're, you're still above two. Um, two, you still have capacity to get to the 1.25. You'll see the final column to the right there is capacity, that's capacity to get to 1.25. I think as we move forward in the future, if we are running more uh, runs with the analysis and the financial management plan, I think I'll add a column that's kind of capacity to that 2.0 level so that we kind of stay in line with what SMP wants. I think this rating is important for the utilities to ensure they keep getting lower interest rates. 
it's just one of the things that I think will be an added, added benefit as we move forward, um, looking at the financial management plan and kind of funding the CIP moving into the future. Um, so that said, this capacity right now is set to the 1.25. I kind of wanted to do uh, apples and apples to the pre-sale report. Um, so the final thing I'll note is we wanted to afford you some financial flexibility in that offering these bonds with uh, optional redemption, meaning that you can call these bonds should you find lower interest rates in the future. However, you can kind of see how they structured it at about a 2.2 in, in 2030. 2.2 interest rate and higher, you're really, um, you know, it'd be hard pressed one to know what the interest rates will be at that time, but it may be kind of hard to beat that. But that said, there are certainly other reasons that you may need to call the bonds. Um, and certainly we can, we can look at that as it comes, but that that's a typical call, uh, timing when it comes to revenue bonds that are of these length of this length and you didn't see it punish you at all in, in the rates certainly. So I think all in all good, good results. Um, and I'll kind of take any questions that you have um, on the bond sale. Have, has uh, Northland bought bond? I mean, do you keep track of who buys our bonds? Of the, so we didn't issue the 2015 revenue bonds. Um, Cause I don't, I believe we were only partially engaged as your municipal advisor. And if I remember correctly, you were working strictly with an underwriter then. And so it would have been Hutchinson that sold those. Northland's bought in other areas of Western Wisconsin, certainly. Um, it's, it's a common bidder that we see. <coughs> Similar with the other, the other bids, I didn't see anybody that was kind of like, whoa, who's that? Um, um, you know, you get a lot of Baird in Wisconsin. You get a lot of Bankers Bank out of Madison. You'll see that bid especially of this side size, Bankers Bank will jump away if it's higher, but um, this is all pretty typical in terms of the bids. It's good, and I'll just say finally on the bids, it's good to at least see three. Um, if you see lower than three, that's bad news. Um, and something that's you know either in the transaction that's offered incorrectly, uh, but with five, you should be very happy with that, so. Box, Box Financial Securities and Bernardi Securities were two bidders on this bid, and they have purchased uh, bonds in the past, in the recent past. Okay. Any other questions? If there are no other questions. Do I hear a motion? I move to adopt resolution 1918, authorizing the issuance and sale of. One million six hundred and sixty. Oops. One million six hundred twenty-five thousand dollars in water and sewer system revenue bonds, series two thousand nineteen B of the City of Platteville, Grant County, Wisconsin. Payment of the bonds and other details with respect to the bonds. We have a motion by Robin and a second by Isaac to adopt resolution nineteen eighteen. We'll vote. Yes. Yes. Killian? Yes. Klein? Yes. Shanley? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Arts? Yes. Motion carries. <coughs> and now, uh, while I sign this, Howard, uh, can you, uh, <coughs> for the benefit of the students who are here studying infrastructure, can you say what, tell them what this pays for or will pay for? Okay. Um, actually, what this does is it uh, helps us pay for the infrastructure that is that is and has gone in this year to include uh, water and sewer work on, on Lewis Street, North Court Street. Um, we had some work down at the wastewater plant. We had uh, um, new aeration basin diffusers that went in. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember some of the other things, but those, those were the primary ones that we had that uh, that we're using this money for. That was perfect, perfect timing. All right, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is um, contract 919, snow and ice removal. <laughs> Very and appropriate. And this may be the, the first time we've been talking about a contract for snow and ice removal after we've actually had <coughs> snow and ice. I don't know. 
<laughs> I tried to do it beforehand, but the, the weather had other ideas. Okay, every year we contract out for removal of snow and ice on sidewalks in front of properties that do not shovel their walks. We build a city based on the square footage. Uh, the contractor builds the city based on the square footage of snow and ice removed. The cost of the removal plus a $30 administrative fee per parcel is billed to the owner. Um, we provided bid packages to two local firms. Uh, we received one bid. The procedures are that the code enforcement officer documents and measures a snowfall. When a snowfall is two inches or more, uh, staff will document it, uh, go around to sidewalks after 24 hours to document potential violations, place a door hanger, and document that address. Uh, this list is provided to the contractor. <coughs> the contractor will only go to those documented locations. If the sidewalk has been cleared, no further action. If it has not been cleared, the contractor removes the snow and ice. The property owner is billed for the service. Uh, per former city manager, Kurt, we uh, held a meeting with potential contractors. We changed our, our bid and instituted a call-out charge. Uh, some additional information requested from the last time. Last year, there were four call-outs. Uh, three in February and one on March 1st. Uh, it took place late in the snow season. Prior to this, the snow generally melted shortly after each of the snowfalls. Uh, there were a total of 21 properties that the contractor was paid to remove the snow. Using that above data, the call-out charge would have been over $114 in order to, to match that. Also, based on the comments, staff will be directing the code enforcement officer to be more stringent in the interpretation of snow removal. The desired condition shall be the entire width, or as was stated last time, grass to grass. In any case, the sidewalk shall be passable for wheelchair-bound persons with a minimum width of 36 inches. Uh, we have basically two options. One is to award to Four Seasons Landscaping at the prices quoted and either absorb the call-out charge or uh, increase the admin fee. <coughs> Which would be increasing the fee by at least $100. Correct. Um, the other option right now is to reject the bid. Uh, based on the discussion, we've, act, we've uh, looked at developing a simplified process uh, for this if the council should uh, consider this. Um, <coughs> after the staff, the code enforcement officer uh, places the door hanger, uh, after the additional 24 hours have passed, we would direct the CEO to reinspect the parcels and determine which sidewalks do not comply. A list of the non-compliant addresses only will be provided to the contractor to go and uh, remove the snow and ice and the contractor is paid for those. Um, we <coughs> believe that under this the call <coughs> charge could be either removed or significantly reduced because of the uh, because the CEO has done the reinspection. Um, if the council believes that this is appropriate, we can do a, a an accelerated bid process where we rebid with actions at the next meeting. Um, so based on this, uh, we're rec recommending that we reject bids and rebid this with the simplified process. Okay, questions from council members. Going back to the beginning, um, I had a question last year. Which sidewalks are checked? You check all of the residential, and does that include also going out to U-Haul? Does it include partly going out to the <coughs> hospital? And also, um, does it include businesses here in Platteville? It does include businesses. Um, based on comments from previous years, uh, 
um, it was direction of city council to not enforce this on sidewalks in subdivision areas with less than 50% um, development uh, because of the issues that we had with the Keystone uh, subdivision of few years back but this also applies to businesses um, now the um, the trail that goes out along east side road uh, is the snow is removed by city staff uh, just like the trail along water street um, so those are those would not be um, enforced because the city uh, does those. But you do enforce the one from uh, that goes along Mineral Street out to Yuho? Yes. Okay. We've done that in the past. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so the uh, the question before the council is, do you want to adopt the bid that was given, which includes a $600 call-out fee, and uh, uh, 19 cents per square foot, $39 minimum per location for snow only, 24 cents per square foot, or a $49 minimum per location if it's hard-packed snow and ice? Or actually, they what? They're more than that. Twenty-five. That was last year. Twenty-five per square foot. Fifty dollars <coughs> minimum for snow only. Thirty dollars per square foot. Sixty dollars minimum per location plus the six hundred dollar call-out fee. Um, <coughs> or would you like to rebid the contract and implement the new process where the code enforcement officer will visit a property two times and the contractor will be uh, given only properties that need to be um, shoveled, and the contractor will be paid for all of those properties, whether or not they were shoveled before the contractor arrived, and the person at that residence will be charged. Correct. Whether or not, if the, if the contractor was given their name and had to come. And then we don't know what administrative fee might be we uh, have to look at that. That would be a rebid. If it's the council's desire to um, reject the bid and to rebid, we would ask for guidance on whether or not the, the rebid should include any kind of a call-out fee. Um, there was some discussion at the last meeting that, uh, that the, the council may not want any call-out fee. Uh, there may be some concern as to whether uh, contractors will bid, and we've tried to um, <coughs> we've tried to address that through this simplified process, so that <coughs> the uh, the contractor would no longer be responsible for looking at sidewalks <coughs> to decide whether or not to remove snow. They would and, only, and the contractor would not be taking pictures. Um, you still would need to take pictures after after cleaning the sidewalk, but not before because he's going there. I don't know why he would need, he's gonna get paid for it. He or she is gonna get paid for it one, one way or the other. So it seems to me that the only picture that would be necessary would be documentation that the sidewalk has now been cleared and the time and what have you. That's I fine. mean, yes. because they're gonna get paid for everything on the list, whether or not- Regardless of what condition the pavement is in, yes. Right. So I guess the first, uh, Ken? I don't see a need for the call-out fee because we're going to be sending out the code enforcement officer twice. And the second time, the code enforcement officer is going to put down which ones need cleaning. That's correct. Um, the, only, uh, the only possible reason for call-out fee might simply be because last year the volume was very low. Um, I think it can be argued either way. If, even if the volume is low, if all you have to do is go out and clean the snow, then, then there's, uh, there's an argument to be made that there doesn't need to be a call-out fee. Um, but then, though, again, you're still having them be on call, available to do this service, even though it's just a few, potentially a few sidewalks. Now, the way this winter's going, we might have a lot more volume. 
Okay, I think the first question is well, if we, there would be a motion to. Do we open. have a code enforcement officer this time? Then ours. Yes. Put, yeah. A new one was hired? Yes. All right. Uh, the first question would be if there is support for awarding the contract on the current bid. If not, I would think. Uh, so that's the first question. That could be part of the motion. Um, I, I would be in favor of rejecting the bid. I would be in favor of no call-out fee because of the CEO, CEO officer going out and checking the second time and then understanding that if the contractor goes out and the sidewalk has been cleared, the, the uh, individual or the owner is going to be charged anyway. So the contractor will be paid. So I don't see a need for the call-out fee. So <coughs> I would mo move to reject all bids for contract 919 and direct staff to rebid the contract using the procedures outlined in option two above. And that does include the code enforcement officer going out the first time, the second time, and then the contractor going out and being paid um, by the property owner. Second to second motion. Can I hey, ask a clarifying question? Yes, we have a motion and a second to reject all bids for contract 919. Do you have a question? Do you have a question on that um, part? No. Okay. And then staff is directed to rebid the contract using the procedures outlined, and and that was that the code enforcement the procedure will be code enforcement officer goes out, hangs door hangers, goes back to see who hasn't cleaned. If they haven't cleaned, their name goes on the list. If your name goes on the list and it goes to the contractor, you're charged whether or not at that point in time you clean your sidewalk and the contractor gets paid for it, whether or not you have cleaned it by the time it gets there. Questions on that? Yeah, I'm good. I just was reading the budget fiscal impact and wanting to make sure the call out charge is not included in the overall cost. So I no, yep. it, it is. Okay, so we have a motion. Is everybody clear on it? Then we'll vote. Joss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Klein? Yes. Shanley? Yes. Nichols? <coughs> Nichols? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Arts? Yes. Motion carries. <laughs> okay, the next item on our agenda <coughs> is the fuel contract for 2020. It's a two year contract? Yes. 2020 and 2021. Okay. This, is, uh, this has been a confusing thing for everyone. Um, we start. Um, there was a copy on my <coughs> yes. desk, and there's also a copy in my uh, packet. I think the are newest. They are they both the same? No. They are not the same. Which one? Is the the, most the newest. The newest version was the one that was placed on your desk, and you should be. You should see highlighter on the front page. It kind of outlines places where things have changed. Um, okay. Um, we've gone through this. Our current contract is with Mulgrew Oil. Uh, it ends at the end of this year. Uh, we bid the contract for refueling tanks at the city street department garage and wastewater plant. Uh, we use three different fuels, diesel fuel, unleaded gasoline with 10% ethanol, and then we also have uh, a small tank for gasoline with no ethanol for our small engines that cannot use ethanol. Um, there were three bidders for this contract. Um, I asked for supplemental information uh, regarding a sample invoice for the three different products using actual prices as of noon on October 16th. Um, what I had found was that the Mulgrew uh, diesel uh, uh, sample invoice was incorrect. There was a discrepancy there. Um, they quoted for what we call dyed off-road diesel and it was supposed to be for clear on-road diesel. Um, there's a slight difference in that, partially because of, of uh, road taxes for on-road use and partially because of the price of the fuel with the dyeing and everything else. Uh, based on that, um, actually the New Horizons quoted prices 
are lower than the other two, even though even though the the price over wholesale says that it seem it would appear to be higher. I would say discount that at this point because the actual quoted price with taxes, with fees, with their markup, um, based on the final page in the packet, you see that New Horizons <coughs> has a lower fuel cost for both the diesel and the ethanol, which has a much higher amount of fuel being used than, than our no ethanol fuel. So um, at this point, my recommendation is to award the contract to New Horizons. The other item to note is that New Horizons is in Fenimore, Allegiant Oil is in Lancaster, Allegiant Oil has a terminal here in and retail store in Platteville. Uh, New Horizons re recently purchased Hair Oil, which used to be here in Platteville. So I'm assuming that both of those are considered to be local, um, local bidders. Um, so my, my recommendation has changed based on the error in, the, in that one quote to New, uh, I'm recommending New Horizons. Okay, questions of Howard. Otherwise, we do have a citizen who has asked <coughs> to speak for information purposes only. Uh, my name is Jack Ludke. I'm the executive director for the Platteville Main Street program. And I'm really not sure I want to speak now that the ball game has changed the rules a little bit. But um, I was going off of what was posted on the uh, website. And I was simply here to uh, speak to the council and not in favor or against anything, but uh, simply to speak to the fact that uh, they should seriously be considering uh, a local company. And in this, my early scenario, that company was obviously Allegiant Oil, which has a <laughs> footprint within a retail store within the Main Street District. And they also have the bulk plant out at the industrial park. And if we look at the context of what not only the Chamber of Commerce, but the Main Street program and the city in general has been preaching the last several years is that People should buy, uh, shop locally and support local businesses. And I know that from the original numbers anyway, that uh, Legion Oil, for instance, pays a substantial amount of county tax and uh, city tax, which would offset any difference in the price from another company like Mulgrew, which is located in Dubuque. Uh, I, in reading the write up for uh, that was presented to the city council uh, by the uh, staff. Uh, they also call out the fact that the uh, this is not a uh, public bidding situation and the city should consider the best practices to be uh, applicable to not considering the location of a headquarters building. I will also tell you that we have experienced in the Main Street program a tremendous amount of sport, uh, support over the years from Allegiant Oil since the time that they purchased the station in downtown, remodeled it and reinvested in that facility downtown. <coughs> and um, I am not familiar at all with Horizon, uh, but if the difference in pricing there is not significant to offset, they do not have any presence right now, as I understand it, in the city. So therefore, the city taxing situation would not apply. And I know this is a two-year contract and things can change, but I do know the investment that was made by the owners of Allegiant Oil in our community, and I would hope the city would take that into consideration when they look at the difference in the pricing structure. Thank you. Any other 
comments. So hair oil is not open anymore? I'm, I was under the impression that, that their facility is still in operation but used by New Horizons. I, I, could, be in, I could be incorrect. under that impression, although I haven't been by the uh, location lately. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, folks, we have before us a fuel contract, a two-year contract. Uh, Howard has provided new uh, information relative to uh, fuel comparisons uh, based on usage uh, Last year, um, <coughs> the bid from Allegiant would amount to an annual cost of about $94,500. The bid from Mulgrew, $89,600. And the bid from New Horizons, $87,700. So folks, what's your pleasure? I make a motion. And my motion would be the staff, or uh, actually I would make a motion to award the 2019 fuel contract for 2020 to 2021. And I'm actually gonna award, would recommend to award to Allegiant, I'll explain why in a bit, at the price of 0 0.08 cents over wholesale price. And the reason for my motion is the fact that I was looked up what the property taxes are between what the two companies pay in Platteville here and Allegiant, based on what they pay, would more than offset the difference in the bid price. In fact, they employ more people in town, advertise more people in town than what New Horizons does. I'll second Motion. the bid that I'm Isaac made before all the explanations. Oh, so you're going to second that, but not his explanation. No, I agree with his explanations, <laughs> but I don't know if that's part of the motion. Right. I think the motion is to award the contract to Allegiant Oil. Correct. Okay. And that's for Any other questions? Correct. I have a question for the chief of police. <coughs> uh, through the years, off and on, we've had questions about where to buy a cruiser a vehicle. So what are we doing now if we have an in-town bidder and an out-of-town bidder? We've been fortunate to this point that the in-town bidder has always been the low bidder. But in the past, that hasn't always been the case. It has. As, as, far, as long as you've been. Correct. Right. Yeah. But Maybe the, not as long as Ken has been on the country, but as long as time. you have been. OK. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I think we, this is my conversation with the bid. I think we need to stay as local as we can. And I agree with director of the Main Street program that based on the fact that they pay taxes, it would certainly offset any additional costs. They were still paying us more money. We don't know for sure whether New Horizons has a facility here in town. Yeah, we do. Hmm? They did purchase a property on Lily Street from Hair Oil. So that do is, have a property. They do own it. But it's not, I mean, basically you have to have a key or work for them. It's not open to the public you know, as a convenience store, or they don't have somebody staff down there. They just, it's basically, it's their filling station to fill their trucks up and down. Okay, any other questions or comments? Then let's vote. Yes. Yes. Killian? Yes. Klein? Yes. Shanley? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Arts? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, those are the, that's the last of the action items on our agenda. We'll move on to information items. And the first of those is a <coughs> rezoning uh, and annexation request. Okay, um, I would actually consider this basically a, a housekeeping measure. Uh, when the roundabout was constructed uh, on South Chestnut Street, that was kind of a, a joint effort between the city and the county and the university. Um, and at that time, the area south of where the roundabout was constructed was County Highway D. Um, when we did that, there was an intergovernmental agreement that basically said the city would take over 
uh, maintenance and jurisdic jurisdiction of that portion of the street between the roundabout and business highway 151. Um, so we have been doing the maintenance on that, but at this point that section of roadway is still in, it's not in the city of limits, it's still uh, out in the township. Um, so we'd like to clean that up. Um, when we constructed that, the, the right away of Chestnut Street was relocated slightly to the west. So most of that land that we're looking at uh, as being not in the city that we'd like to annex is either current street right away or uh, former street right away. So as I mentioned, it's, it's kind of an area to clean up that situation. There is one small remnant parcel in that area that's privately owned. Uh, John and Susan Kai's own uh, land. It's basically a lot off of uh, Ready Drive. And this is kind of a, I don't know how it became a separate parcel because it's for all sense of purposes, it's the same parcel, but I think there's a quarter section line there. So there's a small remnant that's probably less than 100 uh, square feet that is a separate parcel that has not been annexed. So they have to be a cooperating party in this station because we cannot create a town island. Um, they have agreed to annex <coughs> that remnant parcel and have <coughs> to do so. So that would also be annexed in at this time. Um, since that is the only privately owned property that we're dealing with here, um, we're recommending that the annexation also include a rezoning. Uh, the, the other part of the property that they own that's already in the city is zoned R3, so we're recommending the annexation portion is also zoned R3 um, as a follow-up to the annexation itself that we would change the zoning of that remnant. So basically it's an uh, annexation of the property and right away south of the roundabout to Business Highway 151 or approximately to Business Highway 151. Any questions? Questions. <coughs> How come you're not going to the intersection of Business 151 and what I call South Chestnut Street? Um, We're Highway D. Yeah, essentially Delta 3 did, did, did the map and they, for the most part, they did it as a, a easily defined boundary for annexation purposes and we also didn't want to create a situation where we create an additional town island or an issue with the other property um, in that area um, regarding their access and so forth so it was just seemed a little cleaner to cut it just short of that any other questions any questions the private par parcel is a little tiny triangle. Yes. It's very hard to see. Right. The, and, the, and the, the only map value. you actually can see it on is the uh, map drawn by Delta 3. Otherwise, I think it's overwritten by, on a color map, I think it's overwritten by parcel numbers. Yeah, I'm not sure the, the total area, but the, the assessed value is $100. So it's pretty small. <coughs> Okay, any questions on this? <coughs> Otherwise, we'll see this on our agenda for action next time. Okay, second uh, information and discussion ag item is a mortgage adjustment for the city and an RDA loan at 25 East Main Street. Joe? Right, and I'm not sure that's the correct title for this uh, item, but um, that's what I put on there. Uh, the, the city and the RDA both uh, approved loans uh, back in 2015 that uh, assisted with the uh, renovation, remodeling improvements to a property at 25 East Main Street. Uh, the RDA did a loan that was using their own funds. Uh, at that time, it was an $80,000 loan, and they didn't have enough uh, of their own funds to uh, cover the additional request, so the, the city agreed to do a, a pass-through loan. They borrowed some money and passed it on to uh, the developer at that time. That loan was $172,000 um, <laughs> at that time. Um, since that was initially, uh, project was initially started, there's been a, an additional request or, or a need for additional funds for, from the developer um, due to some in, unanticipated costs. Um, so this was approved back in 2018 where uh, the developer needed some additional funds and there was a, a private mortgage that was in place at that time that was in front of the city and RDA's um, mortgages so the city and, and RDA had to approve allowing that mortgage to get larger to come up with the additional funds 
So we're back to having the, the similar situation due to some unanticipated costs to meet um, some building codes, to meet some fire uh, department requirements for installation of a fire hydrant and fire department connection required the relocation of the water service to the back of the building and some other improvements that uh, were not anticipated at that time. So the developer again is going to need some additional financing to uh, finish the project. So to come up with that additional funding, the uh, private lender that has the first mortgage on this property has agreed to provide the additional funding to the developer, um, an additional $100,000 that will give them the funds that they need to finish the project. However, since that mortgage is in front of um, the city and the RDA's mortgage from a security standpoint, the city and RDA have to agree to allow that mortgage to increase in size. So uh, developers not asking for any additional funds from the city or the RDA, um, our loans will stay as is, but since the, the debt in front of or uh, the city's mortgages is getting larger, it does impact our security um, to some extent. So um, they do have to agree to that. Um, the RDA has already considered this request and recommended approval basically contingent upon the um, appraisal of the property being uh, adequate to cover the debt. And I know they had set a date, a number of 800,000, but if that number is not reached, they would be willing to reconsider it. And uh, I think that they will be discussing this matter again on the 18th and may have a, a different number that they are recommending approval of. Um, so basically the, the council will also have to agree to allow that uh, private mortgage in front of our debt to be increased to dollars <coughs> So that amount will increase from $320,000 to $420,000. Any questions? Okay, questions. <coughs> we do have the uh, building uh, owner here, if anybody has questions. So this is not a request for an additional loan from the city, just permission so that the owner can borrow additional money from a different source. Correct. Okay, any questions? Fire hydrant uh, is for Howard. The fire hydrant cost, it says there's a 5,000 city contribution. So the, the owner is paying for part of the fire hydrant? That's correct. That was, uh, that was an agreement made uh, a while ago uh, between the building owner and city manager, Kurt, when she was here. So how much of the... Fire hydrant is the owner paying. What's the total cost of the hydrant? Well, it depends on what the bid is right now. Um, uh, I don't know if she has a final cost on that or not. Are we talking ten thousand dollars paying half of it or a quarter or what? I'm, I'm just curious. Judy, you would have to come to the microphone and introduce yourself. As to what portion? Uh, the owner is having to pay. So the total amount of Introduce your Oh, uh, my name is Judy Wall, and I'm um, from LMN Investment Properties. And the, they own the property located at 25 East Main in downtown Plathville. Okay. The cost of the fire hydrant is approximately 26000 And that includes opening up the street, installing new water service from the city water service over to the fire hydrant, installing the fire hydrant, replacing the sidewalk, installing two um, cement ballards, and then closing up the street and restoring the pavement to the, to the road as well as all the way over to the fire hydrant. The total cost was 26000 and the city's contribution on that was five. Correct. So 21 for you and five for the city. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Just curious, when else do people have to pay for a fire hydrant? If you're developing a subdivision, are, are they paying for that? Or that's you package deal, some of the street? Yes, um, 
when when a developer does uh, infrastructure for a new subdivision or other developments, uh, in this case, this is an upgrade to the to the building which required um, uh, sprinkler systems, and, which requires a fire hydrant to be able to attach to that. So the cost in a new subdivision of I think Robin's question was who if there was a Fire hydrant put in a new subdivision, who pays for the fire hydrant? The developer does. <laughs> and when you say upgrade to this building, um, was it an upgrade to the building or just modern? Did you do that? <laughs> so uh, without getting into, you know, my opinion of whether the fire hydrant was needed or not, Legally, we hired a mechanical engineering firm that laid out our water plan, and it was in zone to connect to the fire hydrant on 2nd and Main Street within less than 100 feet. And the fire department chief decided that he would like our water service moved from the front to the back of the building. And so the fire department connection is in the back of our building now. But that process involved extending all of our water pipes an additional 80 feet inside the building and then an additional 110 feet from our building to 3rd Street at the cost of Street. running water service an extra 210 feet in length. And for three months, we went around on this because you know, my position was if my building has a fire, that fire department is going to pull up right in front of my building on Main Street. They're not gonna try to access what isn't really even an alley behind it. And the, the back of the building has an exposed basement, so <laughs> the ladders would have to reach four stories on the back of it rather than three stories on the front of it. And at the end of the day, it was my conclusion that the investment in Platteville is worth it, the project was worth it, and I just need to go through the process and get it done and w uh, figure out a way to pay for it, which we did, and um, make it work. But, you know, it was not my opinion nor others that I consulted that felt that it was the best location for the fire department connection to be in the back of that building. But you know, aside from that, I don't think that should be the discussion today. I think the discussion today should be based on the cash flow of the property. And the cash flow has a debt coverage ratio of 1.33 which, as your earlier gentleman said, they usually look for 1.2. Um, the property has the ability to increase in the next two years revenues by approximately $850 a month, which would bring the debt coverage ratio to 1.5 and um, increase the cash flow by another from 1400 and something to um, another 850 added to that, so 2600 So. I think um, from my position as an investor, this is a workable situation. I have to have the means to pay for this. And uh, um, aside from being able to pull it out of my pocket, which I can't, uh, it's an investment. It's an investment in the community. And um, the project is amazing. We get comments every day from the students that go through it. They're you know, astounded at how nice the project is, how nice the apartments are, <laughs> and comment on, you wouldn't believe what is available to us in the community. And I would like, hopefully, the council to feel that this project is the first of many that can be done like this to offer students an alternative to slum housing. And, um, it, and uh, anybody that is interested in going through, I'd be happy to give them a tour, but we are leased through uh, May 31st of 2021, and most of the students that have leased at that point are will be juniors, so there's a high probability that they'll stay for the two years in the, in the uh, building. 
Okay, so any other questions on this uh, request uh, that uh, the city concur with the recommendation of the RDA to uh, uh, ha uh, let the building owner borrow additional money from someone else, not from us? I just, I have a question for Howard. Can I ask? Howard, uh, don't we normally cover, I didn't know I should ask. Um, is there some pavement, the city pavement that's been um, con uh, construction going yes. on? Yes. Now, it's my understanding that anything that had to do with the city making a, a determination and we, the city, um, have to repave. Do we pay for that pavement on public streets? When, when, a, <coughs> when a private developer or a private person needs to make a, a cut in into a road for like a water or sewer service or things like that, um, those charges are billed back to the owners. So whether, whether Ms. Wall does it as part of a contract or whether, or whether we do it and bill it back, it, it's still the, the owner's cost. Thanks. All right. Uh, are there any more questions? Uh, if you have questions specifically about that, uh, see Howard other uh, at a different time. But uh, any questions yet about the mortgage, uh, the request to increase the mortgage at a different uh, from a different lender? If not, I think. Thank you, Judy. That's the last of our information and discussion items. Now, we have scheduled a work session on our ATV UTV ordinance. And on a regular night, we would go to the back table and uh, do our work session there. But I believe, since our, our chambers are pretty crowded, <laughs> that we'll do our work session sitting at our desk instead of otherwise and you don't have to stay for the work session to talk about ATVs and UTVs if you don't want to the meeting itself the action and discussion items are over this is a work session we have two items on our work session the ATV UTV ordinance we have an ordinance that was a one-year ordinance it sunsets this week uh, the day that uh, winter parking rules go into effect no ATVs anymore so we'll be discussing that ordinance. And then the second item on our agenda is the multimodal local supplement grant. That's the one I talked about before. These are uh, additional monies made available through the uh, state budget process for um, road projects, really, road or trails or buses or lots of different things. So um, as general, we would take a little break here and we'll do that. If you want to, I don't know who's going to leave or who's going to stay, um, but it's up to you. <laughs>